to what I do. How many people in here use Kubernetes? All right. Uh, what about Jupyter Hub? Say people that pretty much use Kubernetes. All right, well, I'm going to give a brief overview. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Perfect timing. Okay. It's on silent. <laughs> Crazy. All right, so uh, I, what I did at Haas is uh, I was asked to create uh, a Kubernetes cluster uh, Jupyter, a, uh, for Jupyter Hub uh, and used in teaching. So I had no idea what Kubernetes was. I never heard of Jupyter Hub. Uh, I called my friend, Aaron, who's like, hey, have you heard of this stuff? So Aaron <laughs> came over and kind of showed me what, what to do. And then he left me. <laughs> All right, so, so that's why I invented the name uh, Jupernetes, because I combined Jupyter Hub and Kubernetes. And, and I was pissed off at Haas at the time, so I wrote, because they're making millions of dollars off of this free software. And, then, and I don't think they're sharing with me. But anyway, when I was first asked to uh, put this together, I, you know, I didn't know what it was. I, I didn't know how many students, I didn't know how many professors were going to start using it. We were wondering, are we going to put this on the cloud? You know, we need hardware. What are we going to do? Aaron helped out the software. He said, use Linux. And then he left me again. <laughs> okay, so we decided since we don't know how many students, we don't know what kind of budget we're going to need on the cloud, we know we're going to be paying for CPU and RAM and storage and I.O. We didn't know how big the data sets were. Really didn't have a lot of to go on. All I knew was starting the spring semester two years ago, we needed this up and running. Um, the reason they were in such a hurry to get this up is, I don't know if you know, Haas built this awesome new building called, the, right? It has lots of classrooms. They filled it up with all these new students. They were going to make a ton of money off of that. Sorry, that's part of the I'm still pissed off at them. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we decided to, to actually not use the cloud only because we didn't know how much money we had. We were given a $5,000 budget to, to bring up Jupyter Hub. So what we decided to do was just to create a proxy server using Nginx. How many people know what Nginx is? It's like Apache, okay. So we just set up Nginx as a uh, proxy server and we bought some uh, bought servers off of eBay, and I'll show you what we bought. And uh, we bought some storage. We used NFS to mount the common storage to all the nodes. And uh, then people log in uh, through Nginx. Okay, so this is pretty easy to understand. So this is a typical server that uh, that we bought. 150 bucks. 
had dual hex cores, so we got 12 cores out of that. That would have to have 24 gigs, but you can get them 32, 64. I mean, they're cheap, right? And you can get those on credit cards. You, know, you don't have to go through a whole lot of uh, trouble. Yeah, so same thing. We bought 10 gig switches for 300 bucks. Um, they, they work awesome. I, I think the Zane wound up purchasing like 28 of them because the prices started skyrocketing on, the, on the, the, these Quantas. Amazon used to use these and they dumped them all on the market when they upgraded. So it's 24 10 gig ports. So you're really on AWS. <laughs> <laughs> um, for storage, we use uh, QNAP devices. It's a cheap NAS. So this has uh, I don't know, 12 bays. For a couple hundred dollars, you can stick 10 terabyte drives in there and have enough storage to, to last probably the rest of our lives. But typically, so we, like I said, this was on a shoe, you know, we only had $5,000, so I wanted to save most of it for pizza. <laughs> okay, so the software we chose was to add is Linux, because that's what was recommended. And then I was like, okay, I got Linux installed everywhere, and uh, they said, okay, now you got to install Docker. I'm like, Docker, what the hell is Docker? All right. So I, I figure I go to the web, I search, I install Docker. So then I had to learn how to develop Docker images. It's like, how do you manage this? They told me GitHub. You got to learn how to use GitHub. All right, so then I got GitHub. Once I had that working, I finally ran the script. Installing Kubernetes was trivial. You type, you download the script, you type in kubernetes, and it initializes and says your Kubernetes cluster's ready. Right. And, and on the screen it prints up a line and it says, copy this to all your nodes and they'll join the cluster. I cut and paste it to all the nodes and I called Aaron and was like, hey, I have my Kubernetes cluster up and running. <laughs> so that took like five minutes at most. It was really trivial. Setting up Nginx was not so trivial um, because I, I've used Apache for 20 years and now suddenly I'm switching to Nginx. Um, got all that up and running. I was like, great, now it's time to get uh, Jupyter Hub up and running. For the life of me, I couldn't figure it out. I called Aaron again. He's like, oh, you got to learn Helm. Install Helm. Again, that's a whole nother, it's a package manager for Kubernetes, and that's how I installed uh, Jupyter Hub. And then I, I did a whole bunch of optional scripts. Uh, I know I'm going kind of fast right now because we have an, uh, another presentation that's actually going to show you Jupyter Hub. All right, so uh, what I want to do is, is now I'm going to sit down and go into uh, a shell and just show you some of these settings. Uh, when, when we develop images, uh, 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 um, this is what a typical image looks like, okay, uh, for Jupyter Hub. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a change to this. I'm going to put, I got to put this light down. Yeah. Just to show you the, the the process that you go through. Uh, I'm going to remove slash temp slash glove. I should have been dash rf. Okay, so I just modified my my Docker file, right? So now I got to build a new image. G L O V E. It's V E. Did I type? Oh, it worked. It didn't complain. Did I, did I, did I type? Did I type out? Thank you. I don't have my glasses on, I should put them on. All right, so I just built an image. Um, and now the next step would be to push it. I can't see where my glasses <clears throat> Okay. So what, what I'm showing you is I, I just went through an editing process. So I edit, so typically the way this works is a professor will call you. He's like, I have a class in 10 minutes and I need this library loaded. So I quickly run to my computer, I edit the Docker file, I, I build it, and then I push it out to, to Docker, hub.docker.com. Then on the Kubernetes cluster, I pull it back down. That's not the right way to do it because there's no test involved. Like you saw, I just typoed, I wrote grow. That was intentional, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> so you saw, you saw the, uh, the process. So after you push this up, you download it again. Um, 
on all your nodes. So that way it's pre-loaded. Kubernetes will pull it for you, but you don't want the student or whoever's trying to log in to wait for that pull. So I always pre-pull all my images. The correct way to do this is to use GitHub where you would push your code up to GitHub. I linked Docker to GitHub. So when Docker sees my GitHub code has changed, it compiles it. So Docker pulls that source. It compiles and builds an image on docker.com. And then it'll email me, hey, your Docker fit your your build failed or it's good. Yes? Just out of curiosity, is this on your live deploy production system right now? Uh, not this, uh, uh, this particular image is being tested by Professor. Yeah, so this is going to be live if she's using it or not. I don't, I, I don't know at this point, but uh, she, she knows that I was going to be messing with her, with her image. Just wondering how confident. Uh, I'm very confident. Yeah. I just because I, I, yeah, I'm very confident doing that. <laughs> all day long, I build images for all the professors. All right, so I just want to show you this process where you're editing file, you're pushing it out, and then downloading it. Uh, I also uh, want to actually log in now to, to one of the clusters that we have, if it'll let me. From here, okay. And I want to show you the Nginx setup. Uh, see the uh, sites available? So every time, so currently these are the classes on this particular server. Every time we get a new professor and it's like, hey, I want to use Jupyter Hub for this next class, all I do is copy these config files and I'm going to show you one of these. All right, so all I do is when you install a new image in Kubernetes, like you're deploying a new Jupyter Hub for a new class, it will spit out a new IP address. It's a, and this is why we're running a proxy server. So, so Kubernetes says, hey, your, your new hub that you just created it has a different IP. I copy this, and then I just put in new IP, restart Nginx, and the new hub is up. Now, and so I keep duplicating this over and over again. It's like a cookie cutter at this point. Uh, and I want, so now I'm going to actually go to the web, and I'm going to show you the uh, what the website looks like. It's jupiterhub.oz. Okay, so every professor, every class that so far has asked is listed here. Every one of these then points back to, to the proxy, the Nginx proxy that then gets them inside to the private IP space. When you click on one of these, I'm not going to log in, but anyone you click in, most of these uh, tutorials, uh, I guess I'm already locked in. Uh, it, it cached my credentials. It, it'll ask for your for your CalNet ID. So anyone on campus who has CalNet IDs can use our cluster. <coughs> Some some of the some of the Jupyter Hub implementations are private, like they have special data, so we restrict logging into those, and it'll tell you when you actually click on it. Okay, sorry, so I so I, I went through this really fast. Is there any questions? Before? All right, then I just want to. There's a question back here. Log off. I'm sorry. No, oh, just wondering. I, yes. I, I, do you only host webs, web servers and the, uh, and the images? Uh, yeah, every so every one, one of those on the Jupyter Hub page is a different image. So it's a custom image because the professors use different versions of Python. Some of them are, are strictly R. Uh, we have Math, we, so with this we, we added MATLAB, SAS, Python. Uh, we we added MySQL access, so some like a professor has he wants to teach SQL 101 the spring semester at Haas, so we create an image that has uh, MySQL access, so the, the students have read only they don't have to enter any passwords, 
They just have to type in SQL commands, and they'll access the database. Yeah, but everything on Jupyter Hub is separate. So I think this would be a great time to actually show Jupyter, Jupyter Hub and what it can do. Because it was only like a handful of people that have used Jupyter Hub in here. So to say, this is perfect for you. Okay. So when we first started, uh, we were wondering whether to run it on the cloud. We we uh, have that ability still because a lot of the development is exactly the same. Uh, it just depends on where the files are stored, and uh, you know a few things like that uh, that are specific. Uh, but we could take any of these containers and push them up into Google Cloud or Amazon or Azure or something. And in fact, we intend to do that uh, going forward in the, in the future, because obviously we don't have enough capacity to scale out for all of the students at the business school. And if this really takes off, and it seems to be, then we're going to need the cloud with that. So let's see, I'm going to use another account here. So I need to go and get my phone then, huh? Yeah, yeah I probably will need my phone. So they let you keep that kind of idea. Okay, let me get my phone. I'll be right back. I'd love to. You couldn't find it. Well, I hope I can find it. Good. All right. Don't forget to click the remember for 30 days now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> start the server and what's happening now it's the first time I've logged in so it's going to instantiate these uh, docker containers and put them out on some node somewhere uh, according to where Kubernetes wants to, to place it. Uh, from here uh, we have uh, basically a menu bar up here uh, that can change depending on how the faculty instructor wants it built. Uh, but I'm going to jump in here to the Python tutorials. Uh, just <coughs> want to mention, if I wanted to uh, to start uh, my own uh, notebook from scratch, I could just fire up the kernel of my choice. In this case, we're running either Julia, Python 3, or R, and I'm going to go into the tutorials. And just to show you, um, we have, hopefully it'll start, we have the uh, ability to go in and view various kinds of things that the faculty put together, so a PowerPoint slide or a PDF document or a video. Uh, something like that, uh, which helps with the introduction, of course. Um, ah, so I think your your uh, touchpad is back backwards or something. All right, wait a minute. Oh, where did I go, Tony? Swipe the four fingers. Four. <laughs> ah, okay, here we are. <coughs> so, in each of these blocks here, it's a cell. And the cell can either contain text, markdown, HTML, or code. And the active marker was the one here with the blue bar. Again, we've got uh, another menu 
Uh, and again, the, the, the menu items can change depending on how this is built. But I'm just going to step through this one. Uh, and you notice uh, if, I'm, if I'm editing, it turns green. Uh, if I'm just going through, stepping through, it's just blue. Uh, but the way the instructors have set these up, it's just basically kind of like a math problem, a situational example, a business case or scenario, and then um, they first talk about the concepts and then show you how it's done and then you do the work yourself. And that's basically the, the format. If I want to run this particular cell, I just go up here and click run and so on. Now this one doesn't really do too much. You can see my output here. Um, a lot of these tutorials that they've put together have really nice visualizations. Um, so like, uh, let's see if we go to this one. And let's do the uh, data exploration. So they give a business case about Apple, Dell, and IBM, and Microsoft, and what happens with stocks. Um, so they kind of explain that situation, and then uh, this is what you're supposed to do, load the functions, so run this. And then it retrieves the data, puts it into columns. Index it in various ways, and so on and so forth. Uh, eventually, we get down to running these kinds of plots and seeing returns of different kinds of uh, things with the data. So we can run regressions here and do all kinds of things, just about anything you can imagine. The interface is pretty cool, uh, and it doesn't take a lot of resource to run this. I think it's maybe half a core and maybe for a, cu a couple of gig of memory and that's it. Uh, so we can run hundreds of student containers running these uh, here. Now, uh, as far as you know, just what we're thinking about in the future, uh, middle of the screen. I don't see it. It's right in the middle of the screen, I think. Yeah. Ah, it's <laughs> hidden. Okay. So this is kind of a, a, a bigger view of what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, we have a series of computers like Tony has shown us. Uh, when I launched this container, this uh, instance of Jupyter uh, notebook, it fired up and put it on one of these. I never know that it's anything other than a website. I don't have to know anything other than to log in with my Calumet account. Uh, if you have a Calumet account, you can log into to Jupyter on Hosper you as well. And go to the tutorials and run them yourselves. You can view the videos, everything uh, that I doing here. Um, what we eventually want to be able to do is expand the number of kernels that we support beyond R and Python and, and, and like Tony said, run relational databases, connect up to our Hadoop cluster over here and run queries in Hue or in Paula, uh, connect it to a GPU uh, resource so that we can run TensorFlow or something within the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, and then uh, the storage could either be in the cloud or, or centralized as it is here. Eventually, uh, what we're doing is to work on workflow so that we can burst uh, uh, our excess demand into the cloud automatically so that when we reach a capacity limit here in one of these resources, then it goes to Google or to Azure or to 
Amazon. So this is what we're doing. And again, this is all of this commodity equipment. The, the great thing about Kubernetes is it's like a bento box. Uh, you can have all different sizes and sorts of containers wrapped inside pods, or uh, pods wrapping the containers, and then fitting those within a node, which is the bento box. And when that fills up, it goes to another one. If one of these servers dies, it automatically respawns what I'm doing. What I would see as a user is uh, this would be delayed a bit, and then it would come back. Uh, and generally, you don't see uh, significant outages kind of things. Um, and we actually ran the summer sessions data eight on this old hardware one time when we ran out of Google credits. So uh, it was, you know, it was it was good to know this, and also even better to know that we could run the same thing that we're doing here and that we're developing here in the cloud very easily. So um, this is what we're working towards, a very portable kind of environment where we can pull in various kinds of resources uh, beyond R and Python uh, for instruction. And I think the number of courses has doubled about every semester or so. So. Uh, we, we weren't expecting any this summer, and I think we have, what, three? Three already? Three already? Yeah. So we continue to be surprised by the faculty uh, asking for this. Uh, really, it's just a matter of uh, them learning that we have it available and, and that it is a resource that they can tap into and use uh, whatever they would like. So anyway, any questions? No? Good. Thank you. Thank you. No, I forgot to, to yeah. I just wanted to mention a couple of really important things like why Jupyter Hub? You know, why use a web interface? Like if you're using Stata or SAS, it's way better not to use a web interface. You're so limited. The problem that this solved is huge. One, the first problem is professors hated having to help students figure out, hey, which are libraries? Everybody has a different computer here. You know, it soaked up a lot of time trying to get homework assignments done. So this solves it. Everybody has the same environment. You know, they don't care if you have a Mac, a PC, a tablet. You have a web browser, you have a phone with a web browser, you can do your homework. You know, so it gets rid of that trouble. That was like the number one uh, motivation. The second one, you know, we Berkeley loves talking about equality and all this other stuff. Well, if you're rich and you have a you know a, a 25 core computer, or 24 core computer, or your port, it doesn't matter anymore because you still have the web interface. So a lot of the Berkeley professors are really worried about you know equalizing, making sure that no one has an advantage because they can afford better hardware. So those were really I think the two number one uh, motivations for for us developing something like this. That's another unusual thing at Berkeley. We can't always ever have one number one thing. We always have to have multiple number one reasons. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes, Christian. So for various courses, do you have multiple Kubernetes clusters, or you just have one it's, Kubernetes it's cluster? A single, cluster? It's, it's We have multiple, cl multiple Kubernetes clusters there. It's like some we use for research, and then we have you know, it's like, uh, you know, really tiny ones to practice on. Uh, but we have one main Kubernetes cluster and the one Nginx server okay. that everything goes through. Okay. And with respect to configuration, so, so you've got, from the top down, you've got Kubernetes to, to configure, you've got each of your containers to configure, Docker in particular. Right. How does, how does say, the Docker configuration work here? Where you've kind of got a couple handfuls of, of different types. And um, is, is it, First of all, is the configuration all text file based, or is there sometimes GUIs are really helpful for? Uh, okay, I I've always used um, just command line for right. everything, so I don't know any GUIs really. Um, that's why GitHub is so important. GitHub helps you manage your files when you make changes. You know, you can back changes out. So so that's that's a really good question. GitHub helps. You 
you know, with your source code. And then if you use Docker to help you compile, then you know you don't have any errors in there. So it's the development cycle is I edit locally, I push it to GitHub. Docker sees it, Docker compiles it. Docker says it's good, I pull it onto my Kubernetes cluster. If it's not, I go back to the editor and start the whole cycle again. As far as Kubernetes management goes, after you do that kube init, it, it tells you, it gives you a line, it says copy, paste this line into your nodes. Once you do that, your cluster's up and running. You know, at that, so at that point, the Kubernetes side of it, you're done. It was, it was you know, that was the easiest part. You know, learning Helm to, to actually install Jupyter Hub, that was a little bit, you know, trickier. Yes. So it's something using uh, Docker Hub as your registry? Yes. So is, all, is it all through github.berkman or github.com? That's the information. I, I use my personal accounts, Monterey Tony. Yeah. And what is the CI process for your various Docker images? I'm the, sorry, the what can see like my integration like process, like for testing and like, so we use like Docker Swarm at the library, and so one of the hardest things is not just managing changes to like the applications, but like the underlying infrastructure. How so, do you guys approach that? Yeah, so the process is once we know the image compiled, yeah. That's we, like, we pull down on our test cluster, right? So we have this other cluster that we use. We pull it down there, and then the only testing I do at that point is I contact the professor and they give me their test notebook. Gotcha. I log into Grub and I say run all every one. I scan it, if there's no errors, I'm done. And now it's up to the professor to do his own testing. At that point, I release it and say, this is ready for your testing. Yeah. All right, thank you. As we transition to our next set of speakers uh, from, from Skydeck, I just want to do a quick survey that I forgot to do at the beginning. Uh, I want to see a show of hands of who everybody, where everybody comes from. Who here is from IT staff on campus? There's a lot of people. Okay. Who is a uh, who is a student or faculty member here? Okay. All right. And uh, who is uh, who's uh, who's part of Skydeck overall? And then you can ask. And who is also kind of through the Meetup.com event? Okay. Excellent. Okay. Uh, could maybe uh, we want if you have a, someone next to you, maybe do a quick intro to yourself and get to talk to each other for just thirty seconds, if you will. Did everybody get to know each other? So, yeah. 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 We'll be talking about the health of the company should be and then they, how they aim to revolutionize cross enterprise collaboration. Uh, she will give a demo and talk about the strategy, including decisions to deliver an integrated experience at the Google G Suite. The CEO, Eduardo Alvarez, will be on hand to describe the product's technical details, uh, how it's built on GCP that underpins their work at experience. So, take it away. How are you? Uh, we're really glad to be here and to be telling you a little bit about our story. We're one of Skydex uh, cohort companies for this uh, last session, and we are very excited. So, we're going to be telling you a little bit about our story and how we got to be here. So, we're both project managers. Eduardo is our CEO. He has been project manager for different startups. And I was also a project manager for eight years at a digital marketing agency. And I think we both got the same frustration of how difficult it was to actually do project management properly. Like, if you're a project manager, rather than doing your job, you have to be attacking everyone, like, please update that information. Don't do that on your computer, on your desktop, do it online. It's super complicated. And we finally realized that the only way to do proper project management and to collaborate with your team members or even with external parties was to move people out of their desktops and into the cloud. So that was like a huge opportunity for us and the first thing that we realized 
but there was a huge problem, and it's that there were other 600 companies like us moving project management to the cloud. So we ended up seeing that people were using up to 12 business tools on their day to day. So we're telling people that they need to be more productive, but we're forcing them to use up to 12 tools with different user experiences, with different uh, files and storage, and it's super complicated. They cannot be productive if, if they have to use this many tools. So having to use all of the tools leads to fragmented information and to broken workflows. So we saw a great opportunity, like, okay, there are so many tools, we need one tool that is able to integrate everything that you need when you're doing project management, but also we realized that Google didn't have a project management of their own. So Microsoft does, they have MS Project, which is super powerful. Uh, a lot of people know them and use this, uses them, and nobody likes them because it's super <laughs> ugly and complicated. That's <laughs> the truth. So we wanted to do, we wanted to fill that gap for Google, but we wanted to do it like in a very good way, simple, so that people would want to use it. Because something that happens with project management is that if you're not a project manager and you hear that word, you immediately want to run away. I don't want to do nothing, nothing that has to do with that. So we wanted to create a tool that was able, like it would allow project managers to do their job, but it would also allow everybody else in the team to do their day-to-day -day jobs without knowing that they are actually doing project management. Uh, there are five million companies already that are using G Suite and more than one billion Gmail users. So that was a really huge opportunity for us. So at the end, what we came up creating was an all-in-one workspace that is perfect for internal collaboration. So we're not making you go and use other tools out there. We have all of them integrated into our platform. So you're gonna see a Gantt chart, but you're able to switch to Kanban board, which is super common because Trello did a really good job. So you can have a project manager checking out the Gantt chart and the dependencies and bottlenecks and the rest of the team just taking a look at the camera board. They don't know that they're actually collaborating into the project management flow, but they're doing. We also have time tracker, budget tracker, and these other 12 to 15 tools that people are using all in one, in one place. So the other thing that I discussed earlier was the integration with Google, which is one of the main differentiators in WordCamp. So we managed to create a tool that is fully and seamlessly integrated with G Suite, and that is very powerful because people really know how to use G Suite. They're doing it, they love it, and we didn't want to reinvent the wheel and create everything from scratch. We just wanted them to be able to use what they're used to in a centralized way. So for example, every time that you create a project in WordCamp, you're gonna have a drive folder into your Google Drive, that you're also gonna be able to create documents directly from WordCamp or choose documents that you already have in there. We also create a calendar for you, so you're gonna be able to see the tasks in your calendar, the one you're using. You don't have to have two or three or more calendars like you have to do with other tools. And same for Google Contacts, Hangouts, uh, Google Chat. The idea is to centralize everything that's out there in G Suite into one workplace. And another cool feature that we have is the external collaboration. I think we all know that collaborating today is not only being able to work with your team members, but it's also being able to communicate with your contractors, vendors, uh, partners, investors, whatever. And one of the features that we're, we worked really hard on the past months in WordCamp, it's the external collaboration. So you're gonna be able to send a link to any external party, and they're gonna be able to enter the project, take a look at them without them having to sign up. Mm, so I'm gonna show you a little video about the idea so you can take a look at the platform and then we'll talk about more technical stuff. Mind and structured way where ideas have been limited. For a long time, we have been working in a defined and structured way where ideas have been limited. But that is not how we think. It was designed for people like you, people who want to work faster, together, and simpler. That's WorkUp. It's just what is needed. 
single user experience for everybody, powerful features, and fully integrated with G Suite. It is about motion, everyone adding and creating together. It feels like a conversation, a more human way to collaborate by sending audios and feedback instantly, keeping each other going. It's about objectives, ideas, and people. Even easier when you need to collaborate with clients, contractors, and everyone else. Chart a path to show how you'll get there and keep all your teams synchronized. It's a place to express yourself, where your files and everything is moving, or even to keep track of your tasks, making your day-to-day -day less overwhelming. You have thousands of data to keep on track, projects, tasks, deadlines, and more. What about a centralized way to filter what matters for you? That's why we made work app. Because when your team collaborates better together, big ideas happen. Good. Uh, thank you so much, Manita. Bill, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, nice to meet you. My name is Eduardo Alvarez. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Workit. I will try to make it a little bit less complicated in our side because I'm not a technical guy, uh, but I'm so involved with the, with, the, with the technical team because I'm working with the product team every day. Um, regarding the technical side, we have uh, everything is built on top of, of Google Cloud. So we are using Kubernetes to, to keep everything in clusters. Well, so what we are doing is like, it's a little bit complicated to have all the information of your Google account synchronizing with uh, the working account, right? Because at the end, what we are doing is actually synchronizing all new tools that you have in G Suite, and it needs to be uh, uh, synchronized in real time in working. So in, uh, to be able to achieve that, we need to be really uh, deeply connected with the Google servers. So what we are doing is like, we have a cluster, which is creating like different replications of the same container, and um, that container is, is keeping updated all these APIs from Google. So we, are, we already have like maybe 15 or 20 APIs from Google, which is like, you know, calendar, documents, and all those things. So every time that we create a new cluster, that we deploy the new cluster, we are trying to replicate, replicate more clusters in order to save the balance, right? Uh, every time, because every day appears a new 1,000 users, uh, 2,000 users. We already have like uh, 25 million requests per day. So it's a lot. We have half a billion per month. And actually the platform works very fast. So in terms of the, of the, of the scalability of the clusters, uh, what we are doing to avoid the tags and all those, uh, all those things is we are dividing the, we are isolated the apps. So basically all the apps are isolated in different containers. So they can communicate each others, but internally, but nobody can access them uh, from the external side. So if they want to access from the external side, it would be like an external party, a third party which wants to connect work with, with their services. Uh, we have a key which is which is in Google the Google the service of Google is is called uh, Google Cloud Load Balance. So basically, we use Google Cloud Load Balance to allow external people to collaborate in WorkApp. So basically, they access to WorkApp, they uh, create an account, and they can receive a key, and in that key, they can access to those servers. Uh, but we have predefined rules in order to allow people to, to do that. Um, what is actually working pretty well as well is, is, is the CDN. So basically we use Google uh, CDN, which is Google storage. Um, but we have a different way to do that because we are managing a lot of data in terms of images, videos, audio, because that's how the platform works and the mobile app is actually that. People is taking pictures, sending audios, in the, in the, sending voice notes in the, in, the, in the task and all of that. So basically we are like kind of social media in terms of project management side and it requires a lot of data uh, consumed. So what we are doing on that side is like, we are using that service of Google, but also we are creating our own services inside that services. So what we are trying to achieve is, is kind of the same thing that Facebook is doing. So what Facebook is doing right now to keep all these data synchronized is, is replicating the same server in different locations around the world. So we have like all the information replicated like in 10, Different, 10 different locations. So that is actually providing uh, instant access because the users which are using WorkApp, 
they are mostly distributed around the world. So it could be a team that already have 100,000 users which are spread around the world. So that's actually how that works. And that's in the technical side. Any question? It's good. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. If you want to try it out, you can go to workup.com or you can always write an email to me when the at workup.com. We'll be glad to maybe give you a demo through the tool and take you to all the different functionalities and capabilities. Okay, thank you. Our final presenter today is Krishna, Krishna Nariki, a computer system engineer at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and the UC Berkeley campus. Uh, he'll be talking about what's involved in running a typical application used by researchers on Kubernetes. He'll be con contrasting that with, in the paradigm uh, with the traditional Linux cluster, like uh, the Berkeley's HPC environment in Del Sabio. So, take it away, Chris. Good evening, everyone. Krishna Moriki here. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, more, more about Kubernetes. Um, okay, so the talk agenda was described like this: What's involved in running a typical application used by researchers? Researchers on the Kubernetes infrastructure and uh, yeah, how you compare running on Servio. I'll be using the PRP's Nautilus cluster infrastructure for that to do the demo and. Uh, PRP stands for Pacific Research Platform, and uh, basically, the, by typical research application that is changing quite a bit these days on uh, what researchers are doing, uh, but it's still primarily an MPI application. Uh, MPI stands for Message, pa message Passing Interface. Uh, that's what uh, majority of the researchers are still doing. Uh, on uh, Linux and a traditional Linux cluster. So I have taken that as an example. So the agenda of the talk would be as uh, I would be getting onto PRP demo, running, giving you a demo of running an MPI application on PRP's Linux cluster. Uh, we'll talk about what is involved in running a similar application on Savio. Savio is the UC Berkeley's shared Linux cluster, institutional Linux cluster. And finally, we'll have a discussion on contrasting. Um, okay. So, what is PRP, Pacific Research Platform? I do not know a lot about this project, and uh, this is not the uh, right <laughs> topic for today. I'm not talking about PRP, but uh, this, I know it's an NSF funded project, uh, PR being Larry Smart, and in UCSD and Cal 82. Uh, all that I know is uh, they have purchased these beefy compute servers called Fiona boxes, which has a lot of storage, a lot of GPU power in it, a lot of CPU power in it, a lot of memory in it, and they have shipped those boxes to a lot of academic and research institutions throughout the West Coast. So you can see all the institutions to which they have shipped these Fiona boxes, and all these boxes are connected to some network most probably scenic, I do not know the exact details, but they all they can talk with each other. And about three or four years back, when the members of this project came for the meeting here, they were talking about shipping these boxes to everywhere and allowing researchers get access to all this awesome power spread distributed throughout West Coast. And I, I, I was thinking, oh my God, how are the man going to do it? Uh, it's, they are distributed everywhere, what they're going to do. But I'm surprised with the amount of progress they made. Uh, they chose Kubernetes for managing all these clusters. And uh, it is amazing what they have done. Um, we will be using this platform um, to run, uh, I'll show you running the demo of uh, running an MPI application here. Okay, and the name of the cluster is Nautilus. That's the name they chose and uh, everyone who has a UC Berkeley affiliation can get an account on this cluster and try it on yourself for free. Uh, here is the documentation page uh, for that. According to them, they define Nautilus as a hypercluster 
for running containerized big data applications. Um, so they are not claiming it's a traditional Linux cluster running IPA jobs, but uh, uh, we're taking that as a test case and trying to see more how it works. Uh, they use Kubernetes for managing and scaling containers and everything. Let's see. Okay, I'll, then now I'll move you to move into the next part, which is the demo. Let me see uh, if I can get this mic to stand here. Oh, it's too heavy. Uh, let me see if I can use my pocket here. <laughs> oh, okay, this is, I hope this is good. It's Berkeley ingenuity. Okay, let me see. Because I need both my, both my hands, I'll be doing a lot of typing. Give me a second. Let me... Here I'm sitting on a VM that I have, uh, came with KDL3, and um, then I hope you can hear, still hear me, right? Okay. CTL cluster info. You can see my VM is configured uh, to talk to PRP's Nautilus cluster. So it is looking, talk, looking at the Kubernetes master running over there somewhere in one of those nodes in which we saw in the map. Uh, it knows about the master, so it has been configured for that. Now the first thing which I will do is, I do a demo of launching an MPI application. Um, the way to launch that would be, I, we put together this, there are multiple ways to launch an MPI application in a Kubernetes infrastructure. I'll show demo two ways, right, to start with. This is the first one. And uh, here is a config file that I have put together for that. And in, in there, I'm invoking a Kubernetes resource called, called uh, of kind deployment. And here in, I'm specifying the number of containers that I want to launch or number of pods that I want to launch, which is the replicas. I want to, two, I'm saying I need two pods, and the type of, con the containers that need to be in those pods would be running this particular image, and then I'm specifying the amount of uh, CPU and memory resources I want for uh, those containers that are running within the pod. So it gives you a feel of what all you would have to as a user, we would have to do uh, specify the image that you want, number of uh, image, number of instances that you want, the CPU, compute resources, and then I am using the Ceph storage with the root driver in it. I got a volume created for me um, you, by the system administrators of PRP of the Nautilus cluster, and here are two sections. This is volume mount section, and this is the volume section. In volume section, I define the actual storage that I'm trying to use, and that particular storage, how I would be using within the containers is defined in the volume mount section, wherein I'm saying, mount this storage at the path slash NFS on each of my containers. So it gives you a feel of what all you need to put together. I mean, I'm, my goal is not to teach you YAML syntax here, but just to give you a feel of what, as a user, you would have to do to run an MPI application on the Kubernetes cluster. Once you come up with a file like this, uh, what you need to do is wait, very simple. You will create, that's the name of the YAML file. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, I have them running already. Let me kill them. Kill them first. Okay. So you can see that uh, they are terminating. In a second, they should be gone. Let me start with a clean slate. 
Anyways, they're not meeting. Assume they're, they're not there. Now, just launching those pods would be as simple as, simple as kubectl create dash f and then you provide the paths to the YAML file. So they will be created. Now if we see what happened, you can see the old ones are terminating uh, with these IDs. This is, these are the pod IDs and the new ones started creating. Right? Now they are, the two new ones, 69x5j and 45, h45c2 are running. Okay, so this is what I did is I said uh, create a Q Q Kubernetes resource of kind deployment with uh, which has replica of value of two. So create two pods in it and run one container in each of the pods with that particular image and mount the storage, the slash cable file system at the path NFS, slash NFS on it. So you, it, this is equivalent to you got to, in the, in the old days of AWS and GCP in the cloud, equivalent as you got two VMs running. Now you need to configure these two VMs to be able to launch your MPI application. Um, so you can put together a script like this, initialize your cluster, uh, wherein you see how many processes, how many actual processors you've got on each of the nodes, and then you go and run setup scripts on each of the containers, and you update the SSH keys on each of the containers. So I'm going to launch that now. So this will, initialization will take about five minutes for these two containers. Instead of that, I have two already running in a different namespace. If you remember the commands that I'm typing, so here are the two that I have running in a different uh, namespace. So the Kubernetes has this concept of namespaces where the, the different environments. In the first tab, I was using a namespace of uh, what was the namespace that I was using? I was using UCB Cloud Meetup. Cloud was there. That's the namespace. Here I have UCB Meetup where I have two instances already running, and these have been configured, already initialized for. Uh, um, what, 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 so what I did by initialization is running these two scripts, right? Like I ran the init cluster. The the main part of that is running the setup script and update keys as such. Let's quickly take a look what I was trying, what uh, I did in part of those, as part of those two scripts. Setup, you can clearly, see, you can quickly see that above the base image that I had, I have been installing a whole bunch of packages to that, especially OpenMPI, the MPI library uh, the, that I needed to run my application. I'm doing a lot of management of uh, host file, SSH configuration, and I add users, any, special, any new user accounts, groups that I want to create on the nodes, a lot of configuration changes related to SSH SSHD, such that the MPI processes on one node can talk to the MPI processes on the other node. Um, that's all needed for MPI to work. And create an MPI host file, which is needed for MPI. I'm assuming uh, folks here have some awareness of what MPI is. You would, you would create an MPI host file to launch your application, your parallel application on those uh, two containers. Uh, that's what I did in setup, uh, setup script, and then update keys. You create keys such that containers, uh, the user account on one container can access the user account on another container. Um, this is what the basic configuration of uh, nodes is all that I did. So these two containers are ready for that. Let's go ahead and launch our application, actual MPI application now. Um, so I have a comment so for quick consumption here. Let's see. The first one I'm going to demo is a simple MPI hello application where you would launch the MPI uh, initiator. You do an MPI init, create a communicator, get uh, the, both the containers to be part of the initiator and uh, Process launch MPI processes to say hello to each other. Let's see what happens. You can see uh, it's running. 
Uh, before I do that, let me run one more command. Let me actually run this one and show you what's the, where the actual com containers are running. So I launched these two pods, right? CXP and VXC. So these are the two pods. Each of them has one container running on them. And they are running in these two nodes. One node in UC Mercer, the other node in UC Riverside. UC Riverside. So you can see that it's actually distributed. And then I launched my MBI application, which is a MBI Hello application, uh, with uh, 40 ranks in it. So 40 tasks, MBI tasks, rank 1 through 40. And you can see some of them ran on the CXP AW pod, the container running within this pod, which is running in UC Mercer. And the other ones ran in VXC 6J pod, the container running in this pod, which is running in UC Riverside. So, it's a straightforward way of running it. it. This reminds me of how I created the virtual clusters in uh, uh, AWS about 10 years back. Bring up VMs, run a whole bunch of initialization scripts of those VMs, configure SSH, create user accounts, uh, let it connect those two VMs together, have an EBS volume created, and mount it over NFS on those two volumes such that the files can be shared be 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 between those two volumes. I do have that slash NFS created, right? That's where I have it. So you can, you can if you remember my actual execution command, my binary is coming from slash NFS slash MPI MPI. So I'm using the storage. Um, so it's very s similar to the approach we took in AWS. So the only difference is these are two containers, and containers are brought up by Kubernetes instead of the AWS SDK. Uh, so this is one approach. Uh, let's move on to, let, I have another binary here, let me show you that also. So far it's going smooth, so the demo is, okay, yeah, even this is working. So this is an MPI data application. In this one, there is actual data transfer happening between the MPI processes running on UC Mercer and UC Riverside. So you can see task is sending data to other products and running on a different container and a different pod. So it's a straightforward application. So let's move back here. Uh, so yeah, this in UCB Cloud Meetup name, namespace, the initialization just finished. So yeah, the, the words just started running. I don't need them anymore. Let me delete them. Just, yeah, I create dash f and delete dash f to delete your processes, delete your pods and containers. So they're terminating. So this is, as I said, uh, many approaches and demoing two. This is one approach of getting your cluster to accommodate MPI applications. Uh, let's move on to the next one. So this is what uh, PRP is recommend. PRP folks are recommending to use these days. This is based on Helm charts. Tony talked about Helm charts. A little bit complex, but it gives you a lot more power and flexibility. And truly, all the capabilities of Kubernetes, the good features of Kubernetes, can be leveraged when you when you take a, a Helm chart kind of approaches for installing applications. So now I have a different YAML file which looks more complex, but it's a lot more capable. So you, if you remember, my previous subflow.yaml file was just one page, and here it's a really long YAML file. It is created out of a Helm chart. I will not go into those details, but I will just show you the difference between this particular YAML file, MPI demo YAML file, and the subflow YAML file which I used in the first approach. So if you, if you look at all the different kinds of Kubernetes resources that I am creating in this second approach, you can see I'm using at least five. In the previous one, I just did kind deployment. One deployment is the one kind of resource that I use, and I brought up the two parts with one container in each of them, and I did a whole bunch of configuration of SSH keys, user account, and everything manually by my shell scripts. In here, we are trying to achieve majority of all those local configurations using existing Kubernetes concepts or resources. Uh, we, these are uh, creating a secret, creating a config map, creating a service, a stateful set, 
and a pod. These are different kinds. So I was giving a demo of Kubernetes, intro to Kubernetes to my team members last week and uh, the version of Kubernetes I had, I looked at it and there are like 52 different kinds of resources. So we are seeing five on the screen now, right? There are 52 in that particular version of Kubernetes. So mastering Kubernetes is getting familiar with those 52. When to use those 52, what would you get <laughs> if you use 52? Uh, so you start somewhere and you start building on it. In this particular example, I'm using five. Uh, to achieve the same things the previous in the previous demo I did, bring up pods with containers in them with a particular image, specify the amount of CPUs, memory that I want for each of those containers, configure the SSH, uh, can we create user account and set up the keys for access. That's what that's all this YAML file is doing. It's learn the YAML file, but it's doing all of that. Okay, let's see what happens when I launch this particular YAML file. Make sure I don't have anything running. Yeah, I think we did. We just check that. Yeah, nothing is running. Now. Yeah, simple as that. It just creates it. Now go back and let's see. Yeah, it created in the default uh, namespace. Let me clean that up first. Delete. <coughs> so deletion of the main ma master MPI demo master port takes few seconds, but it's done. Now I'm going to create in my namespace that I want it to be in. Okay. They, are, they started coming up. So if we look at the YAML file that I have, here you can see in the replicas I said, Launch three MPI workers for your worker processes. Along with that, I said launch an MPI master process. In my previous example, in the first approach, I just launched two container, two pods with one container each, and they are uniform. And then when I launched my shell scripts, I configured one as my, my MPI master, others other as my workers. Here, within the YAML definition itself, I'm specifying which is the master and how many workers I need to have, and uh, the master specific configurations are happening on master, and the worker specific configurations happen on the worker pods. Um, that's right. Let's see what happened to all of them now. Yeah, all of them are running, and then it's same. Um, as before, I can go back, go to inside, and invoke my I'm just going to run an API hello application here. So it's just a hello. Uh, each of the master and the worker processes would come back and just say hello. Um, in, as in the past example, I could run the um, MPI array binary, which is in slash NFS, that's mounted here also, and uh, get the processes to transfer data and uh, uh, compute based on that. So it's a very straightforward, simple demo of the capabilities of Kubernetes and how one can get MPI applications to run. So we have 
looked at a lot of installations of how Jupyter Hub kind of applications can be provisioned on uh, Kubernetes and what it provides. And uh, this is what you can do for MPI, which is more uh, typical application for a traditional Linux cluster. So let's go back now. <coughs> now, let's come back to what people have been doing traditionally uh, in, with a traditional Linux cluster infrastructure. Savio is a campus Linux cluster, uh, institutional shared Linux cluster, such all the camp researchers on campus can have access to it, get access to it, they get FCA, faculty compute allowances, uh, allowances on this cluster, and they can run their MP applications on this. How do they do that in this kind of setup? Uh, this is an architecture of their cluster. Um, users log in via SSH. They get onto the login nodes. We have a, a, like four front ends or login nodes. That's where from my laptop, I would just SSH, use SSH and connect to the cluster and land on the login nodes. On the login nodes, I would have to deal with setting up my environment, uh, which particular compilers I would use, which open MPI I would use. And uh, I, I log in as a user, so I do not have a privilege privileges all within this cluster environment, so I cannot just do app get and install OpenMPI. I would have to either build from source or depend on the list of the software packages that the, the system administrators would provide for me. Uh, either I need to learn how to build my application or uh, you use, um, the list, use from the list that the administrators have provided and figure out how to use uh, from that list, which we use comes something called modules. So I have to learn modules, get familiar with that. And then, once I have my software ready, I need to submit to a workload manager called Slurm. Slurm is the most uh, uh, most typical workload manager that uh, Linux cluster administrators use. So you would have to learn Slurm commands, uh, interact with Slurm, specify, okay, this is, now my, my software is ready, submit it to the queue, which will run on the compute nodes, and when you're submitting to the queue, which is the Slurm queue, you would have you would specify, okay, I need it to be running. I need, in my previous example, I said invoke 40 MPI threads. Similarly, you would say, I need 40 cores, CPU cores, and uh, on each core, I need this much amount of memory. Uh, you would specify those requirements, and then at the end, you would say, similar to slash NFS, slash MPI, MPI, hello C, the binary that I have provided in my example here, you would give the path of that binary that you want to execute. And, uh, and this cluster setup has multiple storage uh, infrastructures, either slow NFS storage or fast distributed parallel storage. Uh, when you're running jobs on the compute nodes, we, uh, it's recommended that the Luster parallel file system is used instead of the slow NFS storage. So you choose the your workloads input output folders appropriately such that they land on the parallel file system, not the NFS storage. And you use the data transfer node to move the data in and out. So this is how um, researchers are getting their compute done on a traditional Linux cluster uh, these days. And Kubernetes is the second approach. And so next part is just a discussion, trying to compare these two and see uh, what are the um, good good things or bad things or challenges in each of the avenue, right? So I, I thought of some of things, but I let uh, everyone else have to chime in what they felt like a good part in each of the setups. The first one to me is uh, standardized API. Uh, that's one thing that uh, is very critical these days. Uh, let me explain what I meant by that. Um, in Kubernetes, I've talked about those 52 resources that are available, right? Pods is a resource, nodes are a resource, deployment, stateful, service is a resource. All of them are resources. And in my examples, how I created a deployment resource, I ran the command kubectl sitting on my laptop, cable, sitting on a VM running on my laptop. I did not SSH or connect to any of the TRP resources. I was just sitting on my laptop and executed those commands. So kubectl is a program. Behind kubectl program, there is a, a REST API that every installation of Kubernetes comes with. I can achieve those same things that creation of deployment kind 
uh, deployment resource, or in the second example, I created four, five different resources, right? I could create all those resources using just curl commands, if you know the right syntax. You can, there are URLs, specific URLs. In my first command, I ran kubectl cluster info. It gave me an IP address where the Kubernetes master is running. Connect to that IP address and invoke, reach a particular URL and perform get and post uh, operations on using curl. You can create all these resources. You don't have to use kubectl. Kubectl is one tool that has been built based upon the standardized API that Kubernetes provides. So users can get more creative now. They can write whatever they want. They can write their own Python program. They don't have to use kubectl. They can write web dash, web clients, web dashboards, which just does, which just uses this REST API on the back end and do a lot more fancier things. Providing similar thing on an infrastructure like this, I cannot do that if a user comes to me and asks for that right now. So uh, I'm, we, we maintain these cluster infrastructures both for UCD campus, campus Sanio, and a similar cluster called Laurentium on Lawrence Berkeley National Labs campus. And we get users from the ALS, advanced light source beamlines all the time. And they ask us, I need to be able to use the Luster file system that you have with, I, would be, I should be able to make, create a directory, push data into that by running a Python program on a workstation at the, right next to the beam line. I, I, I don't want to be connecting SSH into your cluster. So I, I don't have a way of providing that in this Savio like Linux cluster kind of uh, environment. But with the standardized API that Kubernetes provides, it's very easy. They can just try the, every, all the resources in the infrastructure, compute, CPU, storage, everything. They are accessible through those 52 resources, 52 resource, all with resources that I mentioned, and they manage the backend storage and CPU and everything. So it's very easy to achieve that with Kubernetes kind of a infrastructure. Um, there is no login node. I would get on. Uh, I would have SSH too. I didn't do that. I was just sitting on my VM and interacting with the master. If you are working with Savio, all of you would, would have logged on to one of those four login nodes. And if you are a savvy user here, you know how loaded these nodes have been recently, and uh, getting work done has been a difficult thing. So it's it's a great thing that Kubernetes, the great model that Kubernetes provides for the traditional Linux clusters. Uh, scaling up of resources and uh, scaling down of resources. Uh, this is the next one. I uh, will go back to my terminal and show you. Um, so let's see. <coughs> So in this MPI demo example, I launch one master, and then I have uh, uh, three um, workers, right? Let's say I want five workers. It's one simple command sitting on my laptop. I don't have to go anywhere. And, uh, did I miss something? Yeah. Wait a minute. So, just that. Just one single command. Increase the replica count from three to five. Now go back and see, there are more five workers now running. Simple as that. Now if you want to reduce that, reduce that to two. The three are terminating, the, uh, the two workers are running. So scaling up and scaling down is very trivial here, very simple. With the so very easy. Achieving the same thing with the Slurm workload manager would be a lot of work, a lot of automation, something that would I would have to develop as system administrator of Savio, and I don't have that, uh, I don't have any, any such capabilities, and uh, there is no scope for that. Automatic recovery, which is one other amazing thing, uh, which I think uh, Tony has talked about briefly in his thing, where let's say, I want to go now and delete one of these workers. Take a few seconds, but let it get deleted, and we'll see what will happen. Yes. 
Either way. Anyways, so usually deletion takes few seconds. I don't know why exactly, but uh, as soon as this were, this particular pod worker one has deleted because of the deployments and uh, stateful set kind of resources that I have used in Kubernetes configuration, that pod would be automatically restarted on either the same node or a different node. So if nodes die, stuff gets migrated automatically. <coughs> and, uh, I think, uh, yeah, Zane was talking about it, that his, uh, as a user, his Jupyter notebook will freeze for some time and then it will be accessible. This is what is happening uh, at the back end. I deleted one, now go back and see, my worker one is back up and, run, up and running, even though I deleted it, because of the stateful set kind of declaration, that uh, kind of resource that I have used. So the, these are all, these are all great features of Kubernetes compared to uh, Linux cluster, but other things where right now which are kind of important when I'm running a cluster like Savio is robust control on the kind of resources that I'm granting to users. Um, maybe possibly Kubernetes has that capabilities. I have not seen that yet in my uh, little exploration of Kubernetes. Uh, there are two kinds of specifications in Kubernetes, the amount of CPU and memory you want. Uh, but strongly limiting to the exact amount they specify. It's, it's kind of linear. If there is free CPUs available on the node to, and the application is trying to use more CPUs, Kubernetes will just let them do it. But I don't know if there is a way of limiting them to... But those are all kind of important in a Savio setup because we grant these allocations to faculty, 300 core 300,000 core hours per year. So we're keeping track of how much each user has used, okay, usage tracking, on all those things are very important. Maybe Kubernetes has the, all those capabilities. I have not, I have not seen them yet. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, those are some things which are very critical. For, and Slurm, which what which what we use in uh, a traditional Linux cluster like Savio, comes with a rich set of support for all these requirements. So you can properly monitor the usage, keep track of them, control who, uh, how much is being used by which, which user and all of that. And then, other basic thing is, the things that you can orchestrate and schedule in Kubernetes is containers. So your applications have to be in containers. Um, either as a user, be comfortable you creating a container, putting your application into container, and deploying that or if you just have source code, try to either the administrators of the Kubernetes cluster should give you the base containers and based on those base containers, you should be able to get your application running or be able to put your application in a container and be able to talk in container language. That would be a basic requirement uh, if you want to start using Kubernetes, right? That's one basic thing. And another thing is, yeah, Kubernetes does give lot more power and flexibility to users. Like you want to give a different over the operating system, and however you want to configure, whichever package you want to use, yeah, it's up to you. You can start using all of that. But it, it's a lot more work for the users too. Um, administrators will not be able to uh, debug each of your problems. If we, let, if we let you bring your own containers and start running them on infrastructure, it will, we will have limited visibility into what exactly is happening and if there is a failure, there is only so much we can debug and uh, provide you diagnostics and you would have, as a user, you would have to do a lot of that. So that's another thing. Um, those are some of the things that, and a big thing that I have not talked about is actual security. Uh, security implications, I, I did not put that intentionally because it's a big topic. And I don't think I am <laughs> knowledgeable enough to evaluate one or other. Uh, I'm, uh, I don't think I'm, making, I'm trying to make a point that one is better than the other. This is just my observations. I don't think I have my decision myself that one is better than the other. Uh, reviewing security is another uh, big thing uh, that we want to evaluate when you're comparing these two models. Um, what else? I think that's everything that I wanted to say. Questions? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Tenants of both you and the presentation, Haas.
Would you both talk about automatic recovery? That's of pods, but do you have any automation in place to protect a node going down? Uh, I, I'm sh so if it, so, I showed you the two the two pods. One was running on Mustard, and one 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 was running on UCR Universite. If the use one of the nodes Mustard nodes dies, yeah. then that pod would be automatically moved to right. a different node in the cluster. But the node itself is not replaced. The right. node itself. <laughs> Well, there are hundreds of nodes, one node went down. For Kubernetes, it's all the nodes are identical, uh, unless you have special resources like GPUs or KNL, Intel, Xeon, Pi's in particular nodes. You can specify labels on those nodes. Okay, this particular node has this particular resource. Then when a, when a pod is trying to come up, and the pod can declare, okay, I need to be running on, if the pod can use a selector and say, I need a GPU V100 node. Then Kubernetes scheduler will try to do the matching. Okay, this this pod needs a V100 selector. It specifies V100 selector. Which node has that particular label only? Then it will launch that. If there are no nodes with V100s with free code, free CPU, the pod will just wait coming up. Um, but if there are two nodes with V100s, one went down, for pods running on it, it will just move to the other node. Um, for Kubernetes, it's just additional cores. Um, Additional protections, I don't know what do you have in mind. So I mean, so right now for us, you know, essentially if a node goes down, it's like you get a page, like you get a text or something saying like, get on it, fix it. Mm -hmm. But because they're homogenous, like you could have like an embedded system where if that happens, you automatically spin up a new node. I was just wondering if I was actually doing it. Okay, so basically you were interested in Kubernetes has any tools for monitoring and notification? No, 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 just detecting that a node is down and then auto basically I'm wondering if you guys have already built it. I know Kubernetes doesn't have it built in. Okay. But you know you so have So instantiating an entire server node. Yeah. Automatically so replacing the whole node. Yeah. I guess if we deployed it in VMware that would be easy. Yeah. Yeah. We use it yeah, but, we have like a base image. But if we have just hardware we'd be it'd be on and yeah. using already. We don't keep it as bare. Yeah. Yeah, to that extent I have seen features of Kubernetes. Kubernetes is not a OS provisioning tool. Uh, you need to have the nodes provisioned with operating system and running for Kubernetes to get on top and do its magic. If OS needs to be provisioned, if a node needs to be rebooted, I haven't seen any capabilities in Kubernetes. Maybe there are plugins that people have developed, Kubernetes Ansible kind of. Uh, I, I do not know. I'm sure there are. Kubernetes is so huge now. <laughs> so I'm sure there are some. But Kubernetes is is container orchestration not the basic node provisioning tool. You need to have another node provisioning to Ansible or Chef or Puppet, which does that for you. Mm -hmm. Question, do you have anything for, what do you use for alerting if your nodes are starting running out of resources? Uh, I, I don't have any, any infrastructure in production. <laughs> this is our PRP's infrastructure. So uh, I don't have anything, I, we, have, we have a couple of, test deployments of Kubernetes where we are playing the Jupyter Hub, the other learnings that I have from you on Kubernetes. It's a development instance that I have going, so I, it's not properly instrumented. I don't have a lot of knobs on it yet. So. Does anyone have any, any alerting for Kubernetes? Well, not just Kubernetes. We just have external monitoring, and then I've been playing with piping metrics to Prometheus, which is what I thought of when you talked about oh. compute hours. Was okay. so kind of tailing the... So I use Prometheus to collect the metrics and then I display yeah. using Grafana. That's yeah. some amazing graphics. Right. Yeah, yeah, Grafana has good graphics. In but I have to look at it. Right. And I'm trying to get to the next step where if, you know, if we're running out of memory or CPU, I want alerts. Right. And that's what I've been trying to get to. The only thing I had hoped that groundwork... Does anyone here work on groundwork on campus? No? Maybe. Well, I was, I, it's we're, like we're a, familiar with it. What's the what's the? Question? Well, that was one of the first features I asked for was could you pipe metrics into groundwork and then auto generate alerts based on those? It's like so we send our logs to Amazon CloudWatch logs partly because it's so easy to set up metrics and alerts based on that. But you guys have to pay for it. I don't have the answer to that question. My guess is that the answer is yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. Um, whether we will be able to is a different maybe. So I know Tin and uh, Tin and Nicholas have been working on some local internal scripts for Savio infrastructure. When node goes down, uh, portals to show what the status of the 
uh, 800 nodes that we have in the cluster and uh, try to automate the operations and maintenance of those 800 compute nodes. Uh, so yes, we have a few things developing developed internally. Yeah. It's the internet Kubernetes cluster? It's a uh, Savio, Savio cluster, okay. the traditional Linux cluster, yeah. uh, which OS is uh, provisioned and we use Slurm for the uh, workload uh, schedule. I just want to actually add, um, I know Nurse used this thing called Ranger, mm -hmm. which is kind of like a Kubernetes farm management tool. Uh, I don't, I'm not familiar with it, but I would imagine they might actually have something that I should look at the hardware and you know check out the stuff like that. Right, yeah. I was going to ask kind of following on that, do you see Kubernetes as, as being kind of disruptive for high-performance computing clusters? Do you think more sites will go to this kind of approach? So some of the features, those scaling, auto, the scaling, easy scaling, easy access to the user. So I never SSH. I was <coughs> running kubectl commands on my VM here, and launching pods, running applications on them. Those are very attractive. Um, but is it ready for adoption? I don't think so. The best thing that is very attractive right now to the PC community is uh, uh, Jupyter Hub's capability. Jupyter Hub runs amazingly well on uh, Kubernetes in backend infrastructure than a Slurm based cluster on the backend. If you have a Slurm based, we have Jupyter Hub installation on Savio also, which is Slurm based cluster. Slurm based cluster, right? But there are a lot of issues with maintaining the Jupyter Hub stack and providing all the features that users are asking for it. But we Jupyter Hub installation that we have on Kubernetes backend, it works amazingly. Uh, we have so many success stories, uh, us, uh, data, data eight, uh, data science classes, so all our success stories of successful use of Jupyter Hub in uh, Kubernetes backend. That is the big motivator. That is the reason why I also started looking into Kubernetes. Um, being a HPC person all throughout my career. Um, I never worked in a web company outside in Google, um, running HPC clusters all through my career. But that's the reason that attracted me to Kubernetes. And then I came across all these nice things. Um, automatic recovery, scaling up and down easily, and users connecting to the infrastructure very easily. Those are strong points. But I don't know if it's uh, at a point where it can just replace uh, traditional Linux cluster. Yeah. I think in the business world, uh, on like web hosting for web companies, before you know you're provisioning a new website, you had to, it was kind of a manual thing. If you had your own scripts or using Chef or Netscape, but now you could type in Helm, deploy WordPress and MySQL. And give me three replicas of it. Yeah. You know, it'll never go down. Your customer's gonna be happy, they'll pay you tons of money with just issuing one command. Mm -hmm. So so I think you know, we're in a science community, we don't see that, but it's amazing what people are doing with Kubernetes and like the business side, just to make their lives easier. What we do see though in research is that our faculty go and noodle and doodle around in this Jupyter notebook environment and get concepts and stuff honed a little bit more before they yeah. go to HPC. Yeah, as um, Jupyter Hub is amazing for learning, teaching, uh, where students are learning Python for the first time, writing their py first Python code, or experimentation can, still working on my Python code, it's not at a scale where it can run on 40 uh, CPUs. For all that workspace, Jupyter notebooks are amazing, right? So for classwork and everything, you need to provide them Jupyter Hub notebook infrastructure, and Jupyter Hub is a nice platform for hosting notebooks, and Kubernetes is a nice infrastructure to host Jupyter Hub. So all of them were hit because of all those reasons. Once they reach the matured Python program they want to run in batch on 40 cores or 60 cores, yeah, then they come on to Savio and they say, okay, grant me a faculty compute elements, my I have a working application which I can run on scale, and they submit it to the slurm. Um, that's what is happening right now. Uh, would they be able to do that same on a Kubernetes backend infrastructure running on 40 cores and 60 cores? I don't know yet, but we'll see. Any other questions? For me or, oh yeah, okay. 
the second speaker, I don't know. It's like they're gone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. This microphone is in the room. Um, I just wanted to let you know that June 25th is the next last Tuesday, uh, so that's next month. So we're going to continue to hold these on the last Tuesday of the month. And I look forward to seeing everybody. We'll have more pizza from Sliver and more really interesting talks. So thank you so much, everybody. I'm now staff on I imagine it being slow, like if you're going from the other side.